People love babies because they are so cute, they're cuddly and innocent. But every parent expects their baby to grow. Growth is natural, a natural outcome of being born. And if growth doesn't happen, there is something wrong. Now, 2 Peter 3.18 says, But grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, the Apostle Peter here is at the end of his letter, challenging his readers to grow in their understanding and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christians are also expected to grow. The challenge to them is to grow in their understanding of the grace that they have received in Christ. The challenge is for them to grow in their relationship so that they will know Christ more and more. Why is this so important to the Apostle Peter? Because he has been warning them about false teachers. How can you reveal a counterfeit? By knowing the real thing. That is why it is important for every believer to grow in their relationship with Jesus Christ. Today, I want us to consider how God grows us. We're going to find out that just being a Christian does not guarantee spiritual growth. There is a process of growth that God wants to work out in our lives. Now, I know some people who have been Christians a long time but haven't grown a very much. There are others who have been Christians just a short time and amazing growth has happened in their life. Why the difference? Well, there's a process of change and a process of growth that God has for our lives that can drastically increase the rate of change in our personal life and it's not about trying a little harder. This is good news. It's not a matter of us just trying harder. That only produces a lot of guilt in the end. God has a process that begins by grace. It's a gift, but it also continues as a gift. We grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We're going to look today at a simple three-part process. He gives us, this process that he gives us. It's simple, but it is powerful. Here's the process. One of the places it's written for us in the Bible can be found in Ephesians chapter 4, beginning at verse 22. Listen for all three parts. You were taught with regard to your former ways of life to put off the old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Three parts. Put off the old self, put on the new, put on the new self, and be renewed in your mind. So the first, putting off the old. The old is what used to be. The old is my life without Christ and everything that had to do with that. What are the old ways of trying to grow? Well, we try to grow, one, by being good. By being good. If I could just do enough good things, then I'm going to grow. Jesus gave his disciples then and now a great picture of why this doesn't work. He talked about wine and wineskins in Matthew 9:17. Neither do men pour new wine into old wineskins. If they do, the skins will burst. The wine will run out and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins, and both are preserved. Now, since most of you don't have a wineskin hanging in your backyard, we need to talk about this. In that day, they would pour new wine into a leather wineskin, and as the wine fermented, it would expand, and the wineskin, being new, would expand with it. Outside, the sun would beat down on it, and the wineskin would harden. Then they can pour out the wine. If you took new wine and poured it into the old hardened wineskin, it would burst as it began to expand when the new wine was fermenting. What Jesus was saying was this, sometimes it looks like it will fit. It fits in the beginning, but there's no room for growth, for expansion. Sometimes it looks like if I could just do enough good things, if I'm 
I'm going to grow if I just do enough good things. But all this depends on our doing. The new way, the new wine, is not about our doing, but about our receiving. It's about depending on God and that His grace will be sufficient to do His work, to do its work. I can't grow just by doing more and more good things. We grow by God's grace working in us. And grace is a gift. Another way of trying to grow is that we try to grow by keeping rules. It doesn't happen by doing good and it doesn't happen by keeping rules. Listen to Hebrews 13.9, the second part of that verse. Your heart should be strengthened by God's grace not by obeying rules. It's not by obeying rules that my heart is strengthened. It's by God's grace. There is a time for rules. When your children are young and little, they need some rules. But a 13-year-old needs a little bit more freedom. An 18-year-old needs even more freedom. Take for instance, if you treated your children from the years 3 to 18 years old with the same rules, would they be ready for the world? I don't think so. They need a little bit more freedom all the way along. They need to grow. The more freedom you give someone, the less rules, the more they can grow. And I see God's grace as the freedom from the rules. Freedom allows for more failures, no doubt about it, but with every failure comes an opportunity for growth. In every failure, by asking, what did I learn? What could I do differently? There is growth potential. As Thomas Edison once claimed, I have failed my way to success. Now, rules cannot produce growth. They control things. They control people. What's the place of rules in the Bible? Well, the Ten Commandments sort of give us some flight plan ideas, some direction. But the power doesn't come through the rules. Rules can't produce growth. It is grace that fuels the jet engines that give us flight. You see, you might think of your life as being in a tiny rowboat in the middle of the ocean. You're all by yourself lost. You know it's useless. You know you're never going to get to land but you're rowing as hard and as fast as you can. You're working as hard as you can to try and to save yourself. And all of a sudden, on the horizon, you see this gigantic cruise liner and it's called God's grace. This cruise liner pulls up beside you and God expresses his willingness to save you. You were lost, now you're found. You climb up onto the cruise liner of God's grace. What are you going to do on that ship? How are you going to grow on it? What does he have for you to do within his grace? There will be incredible things all over the ship for us to experience and to help us grow. But rather, what we do sometimes is remember that old way of living. We go back down in the water, we get our old little rowboat out, our old way of doing things, we haul it up onto the deck of the ship. Then we get back in our rowboat on the deck of that ship of God's grace and we start rowing again. Aren't you impressed with me, Lord? Look at what I'm doing for you. God, however, is saying, I've got a new way for you to live. I've got new things for you to do. Another word for this trying to use rules to produce growth is the word religion. That's what religion is. Trying to make a bunch of rules about my relationship to God. Thinking somehow that's going to produce growth. It has never worked. It never will work. Growth comes from grace. Lastly, in the old way, we sometimes try to grow by feeling bad. Feeling bad. Some people do this. Rules can't produce growth and guilt can't produce growth. But we sometimes think, if I can just feel bad enough about myself, maybe I'll get better. If I really heap the guilt on, maybe I'll get better. 
just logically, you can see why that wouldn't work. If I feel bad about myself, I don't get better, I just feel bad. We're trying to beat God to the punch. We're trying to say, God, I know you don't like what I'm doing, so I'm going to feel bad about it. I'm going to condemn myself that's so that somehow you won't condemn me. Now that's not what God intends to do at all. Look at the promises he makes to those who put faith in him. In Romans 8, 34, who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. You see, God wants to come into our lives. He wants to come into our lives, give us his grace, and never condemn us again. And if God doesn't condemn us, why do we spend so much time condemning ourselves, as if that's going to work in changing us? It doesn't change us. If I don't grow by feeling bad about myself, if it doesn't work just to have a list of rules, and doing good things doesn't cause it, what does? Well, we're told to put on the new. You put on the new. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone. The new has come. This is a promise for those who are in Christ, for those who have trusted their lives to Christ and his leadership. It's a promise to those who have said, Jesus, I want you to be in charge of my life. It's an incredible promise. It's not just a new list of rules, a bunch of meetings that you have to go to. The promise of the Christian life is the old has gone and the new has come. A couple of things about this new life that God wants to give us, first of all, is that we, we don't have to achieve our new life. It's not something you have to achieve. I don't have to make it work on my own. Newness is a creation of God. That's the business he's in. We don't have to make ourselves new. We just have to put on the new life that he gives us. A lot of times we think we have to do it ourselves. That's how we get messed up, my friends. It's as if God came to us and he says, I've got this new life for you to put on. A thousand dollar suit or a thousand dollar dress and he hangs it in the closet and he says here it is a new life put it on enjoy it but we say I'd feel better if I did it myself you've done so much for me I think I'll do it myself and we get over and we go to the scrap heap and we get some scraps together and we sew or we staple them together and we put it on and we say God look at what I've made for you Aren't you proud of me? And I think he looks down at us from heaven and he says, Why don't you put on that new life that I gave you? It's a gift. I want you to enjoy it. You're released from having to try to sew all that stuff together yourself. I want to do something in your life by grace that you could never do on your own. We don't have to achieve this new life on our own. It's already done. And secondly, we don't have to keep our new life. I don't have to hold on to it. Colossians 3.3 3, For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. You see, I don't have to achieve this new life. I don't have to keep this new life. Picture it this way. Let's say I have an old coat and a new coat. And God says, I want you to take off that old and put on the new. Before you become a believer in Christ, you don't have the power to do this. But once you become a believer, you have the power within you to make a choice. But we struggle with that sometimes. Sometimes we think, God, I, I know you've made some changes in my life, but, but uh, I'm comfortable with the, with the old way of living. I think I'll just try it this way for a while. Maybe I'll make it into heaven now and, and, and I'll try to live this way. But once you become a believer, you're going to find that the old way starts to become more and more uncomfortable. It doesn't fit anymore. 
you've got to get it off. We get strategies for dealing with it. One strategy is putting the new life over the old life. We put both coats on. We try to have the best of both worlds. We've got the two things going and it doesn't work. It really feels uncomfortable. It doesn't feel right. One foot in the world, one foot in, in heaven. It's a constant decision. Put off the old, put on the new. Stop taking the old way. Don't, don't stop talking the old way. Start talking the new way. Stop worrying about money and start trusting God when it comes to finances. When it comes even to growing the church, stop worrying about it and trust God. I hear that all the time from the Lord. And sometimes it's a decision made dozens and dozens of time, perhaps even in the same day. Take off the old, put on the new. It's God's new way of living. God says, I want you to look at my son. I want you to look like my son on the inside. I want to give you my son's character. I want you to look like Jesus Christ on the inside. It's slow but sure. It doesn't come in a day. Slowly but surely, God begins to change us. The way Jesus talked to people becomes more and more the way I begin to talk to people. The way Jesus dealt, dealt with, with relationships becomes more and more the way that we deal with relationships. And the way Jesus handled his time becomes more and more the way we handle our time. Slowly, we let go of our life and we let it become his life in us. There's ups and downs. It's not perfect, but it's growth and you're moving ahead. That's the process of taking off the old and putting on the new. Most people struggle with this. Most people say it's tough. I'd love to do that, it's a great idea, but I have a really hard time letting go of some of those old things. It's hard seeing myself in the new way that God wants to see me. And that's why the third step is so important. And it's often the forgotten step. We know we have to take off the old. We know we have to put on the new. The empowering step is number three. Be renewed in your mind. Be renewed in your mind. This, this step of God of renewing our mind empowers us to take off the old and to put on the new. As the writer of Romans 12, 2 says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And again, in a, in a New Living Translation says it this way, Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Note that the renewing of your mind, the changing of the way you think, that's where the power comes from. That's where it is. God wants to change the way we think. We have to renew our minds the way we think. God's changed the way we think so that I can see things as he sees them. That's having a renewed mind. And the more I can see something as God sees it, the more it changes the way I think. If I could see this world, if I could just see this world as God sees it, really sees it as God sees it, wouldn't I have a little more compassion for the people around me? Often I've thought, if I could just see my sins as God sees them, really see them as God sees them, it would change me. I would see how it hurts me. I would see how it hurts others. I would see the eventual results of it. I would change much more quickly if I could see it as God sees it. That's what he's saying. What if I could see myself as God sees me? See this new life as he wants to give it to me. The great news about this is, is that it's not a lie. By his grace, he has given each of us a new life. And when you come to Christ, he gives you a new life. And the more I can see the fact that he's given me this new life and, and live that new life, the more real it becomes. Becoming renewed in the spirit of your mind. It happens by grace. It starts by grace and it ends by grace. Galatians 3.3 3. You began your life in Christ by the spirit. Now are you trying to make it complete by your own power? That is foolishness. 
It's grace all the way. A renewed mind is not just determination. It's a determined dependence on God. There's a big difference between those two. It's not just self-determination. I'm going to do this no matter what. It's a determined dependence on God's grace. Because that's where the power is. The power is from God in His grace. You live the Christian life the same way you start the Christian life. You start it by grace and you live it by grace. There's nothing you can do to earn a relationship with God. Jesus did it all. He accomplished it all on the cross. He paid for all our sins. The only thing we can do is receive his forgiveness and receive the life that he then gives us. That is grace. And we live out this life by grace. Let's say I got on a plane to Vancouver. And on the way there, we get up in the air, and we get up to speed, you know, in altitude, and we're going pretty fast. And I think, we're going fast enough. I think I can complete this trip on my own. So I open the door and I step out, hoping that the speed I've gotten up to in the plane will carry me the rest of the way to Vancouver. I know it's absurd. It's not going to work. And I'm going to drop like a rock. There's a biblical word for this. We get up to speed and then we think, God, I'm doing great. Now I can handle it on my own. And we step out of the power of his grace and we drop like a rock. It's called falling from grace. It doesn't mean you lose your salvation. It doesn't mean you're lost from it. It means you started to depend on yourself for growth, for spiritual life. You started to take it into your own hands. And as soon as you do that, you start the free fall until you say, God, help me. And he will come and pick us up again. And we receive his grace again and the power of that grace. That's being renewed in your mind, starting to think about God in a new way. He's the one who empowers our grace. So the Christian life is not a life of rules. The Christian life is a life of new power. You're living a new way because you have a new power in your life. Maybe you've met some who've been trying to live the Christian life by rules or by doing good or by feeling bad. Now, there's nothing wrong with doing good. We should do good, but not in order for us to draw near to God and to grow and, and to, to, to get ahead. But the Bible teaches about true Christianity. And we need to understand what this true Christianity is really all about, that, that real faith in Christ is built on God's grace. We do good works not to receive his love. We do good grace because we love, we do good works because we love him. And when it comes to growth, there, there are two questions that we need to ask ourselves. The first is this, uh, and I know I ask this, why does it take so long? <laughs> Lord, why does it take, take so long? And the answer is because growth is a process that points, that points forward to eternity. I want to change, and I change a little, but why is it taking so long? It takes time to grow, but think of what's happening. Growth is a process that points towards eternity. And when God changes your character, it's not for a few months or years, it's for eternal life. He's bringing us unto himself because growth is a process that points towards eternity. It takes some time, but the time is worth it. The changes that are happening are eternal. They're going to affect and impact eternity. That's why it takes so long. God has a long-term plan in mind for your life. And the second question that comes up is, where do I start in this thing of growth? Where do I start? Well, there's one word for that, and it's the word trust. It starts with trust. Start by trusting in God's ability to accomplish this growth goal in your life. The motivational power for growth isn't found from within. It's found from within Him. The motivational power is this. God wants and is willing and is working for us to grow every day of our life. The minute I come to Him and give my life to Him, He's working on me to grow. 
if I had to think I have to wake up every morning of my life, the rest of my life, and motivate, motivate myself to grow, that gets very discouraging. But the truth is, whether I feel motivated that day or not, God is motivated, and He's going to motivate you. He's going to strengthen you. We trust in what He's doing. The motivation comes from the power of God that's working within you. You just have to cooperate with what He's already doing. Doesn't that make you relax a little in His grace? Trust Him. Growth is not accomplished by trying harder or trying hard. It's accomplished by trust. Trusting God. That's where growth comes from. And God is trustworthy. There's two unforgettable two unforgettable promises from the book of Philippians about how we can trust God to grow us once we come to Him as Christians. Those of you who are Christians and you're thinking, is He going to keep working in my life? Well, listen to what Philippians 1.6 says. And this is a, a wonderful promise. He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. A wonderful, wonderful promise. Others of you may not be a believer yet. You may be thinking, if I come to the Lord Jesus, I don't know if I can make it. I don't know if I can keep up my end of the bargain. And you feel like you're going to be in it all alone. Well, listen to Philippians 2.13. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases Him. You see, not only does he help me want to do the right thing, he helps me to do the right thing. It's not that I never want to do the wrong thing, because we often do, and we do the wrong from time to time. But God's never going to give up on helping us to do the right thing that pleases him. That's how we grow in grace. Let me pray. God, our Father, help us to draw near to you and to realize that our life, our heavenly life with you is a work that you do in us. It's not about us attaining, it's about us cooperating, working with what you are already given to us. Help us to put on the new, help us to put off the old. Lord, we desire to be, I know, we desire to be all that you want us to be. May that be each of our hearts cry. And in those days and in those moments that we fall short, in those days and in those moments that we mess up, Lord, help us to get back up. Help us to call out to you and say, God, help us, knowing that you will. Encourage us. I know that it seems there are days that nothing is. These days of this pandemic, God, you are working. We may not see it, we may not realize it, but you are working, you're, and you're working in the world because your will will be done. And so we pray that your will would be done in our life and in the life in our world. We need you, O oh God. All people need you. They may not understand it, they may not believe it, they may not want it, but we all need you, O oh God. I pray that we and the world would turn to you with all our heart, with all our soul, and all our strength, with all our might, trusting you, Lord Jesus, in the salvation that you freely give. Thank you, Jesus.